Hello, welcome to The Revealing. Once again, I'm your host, Pavarotti, bringing you information on the Idaho 4 case. Once again, this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. This is my opinions based on the evidence that's been provided through the law enforcement narrative, the media narrative, and the excellent home investigative work that a lot of you online have done. I take y'all's evidence, and then I put together the most plausible scenario. Now today, I am gonna add some speculation of my own. It's not based on any evidence. I don't like to do that, but I feel it's necessary to really get my aspect of this case explained properly. And I'm also gonna to touch on some of the things that I discussed in my last video. Um, as we discussed in the last video, it would be very difficult for somebody to commit these atrocities on multiple individuals in a home such as it took place in without the victims screaming and alerting the other residents in the home. It's very hard to get our minds around that aspect. It is, at least it is for me. So the scenario that I'm going to present to you may answer some of those questions that you have about this scenario. Now let's start with Mr. Koberger. Now we've already established Mr. Koberger has an extensive education. He's a very dedicated individual as he went through all the obstacles that one has to go through to obtain that education, years and years of sacrifice, dedication, study. I mean, it's, it's no easy feat. I also believe that Mr. Koberger studied in other areas because I believe that he had a plan as he went through his studies to aspire to be something. And that something is, is frankly, to, to normal folks out there like you and me, it's not something that anybody needs to aspire to be, okay? Now we established that in high school, he began boxing got into fitness. This enabled him to lose upwards of 100 pounds. I'm also going to discuss some things later in this video that contributed to his 100 pound weight loss as well. But when somebody studies boxing, and I'm assuming that he, he put some effort into it because it seems that everything he does, he puts effort into, he obtained some skills, some real skills in boxing. That's, that's not an easy one to to dabble into. I'm willing to bet that over the years, if somebody was to really deep dive into Mr. Koberger's past, I would imagine that he's studied in other aspects of hand-to-hand -hand combat, possibly MMA, Jiu-Jitsu. I'm almost certain that he studied in Eskrima. Now, a screamer is hand-to-hand -hand combat, particularly, particularly with edged weapons. Now, anybody that's ever been in the military and has gone through basic training knows that there's typically a three-day course, if you will, on hand-to-hand -hand combat, particularly with edged weapons, and that is an screamer training. In battle, if it gets down to the guns are not there and you're in close combat, that's why, that's why the U.S. Marine Corps carry that K-bar knife, okay? And there is a, about a three-day training in basic training camp that teaches them how to engage with that weapon. They don't spend more than three days because typically when you engage with a bladed instrument against another individual with a bladed instrument, it doesn't turn out well for either of you, okay? And the military knows this, but they do provide some training. Now, somebody like Mr. Koberger, I would imagine, would study much deeper than a, than a three-day course. And when you start to really get into the art of a screma, it's going to teach you not to engage with just a knife, but a screma is 
blades in both hands. So it teaches your hands and the instrument in your hands to become as one. And with a lot of practice and study in this art, you can, you can really obtain some deadly skills. Now that's my speculation that, that he has studied in Eskrima. What's probably not speculation is during his course of study of almost eight years in college, even though he was, you know, going for a psychology degree, criminal justice, you know, criminal psychologist. Well, when you go to the university, you're also studying a lot of other subjects. You don't just study the subject that you're, that you're wanting to get a degree in. I mean, you do have to take math courses, science courses. I'm willing to bet during his studies that Mr. Koberger, who was obviously a very good student, I watched an interview with somebody that went to college with him and he was discussing how Mr. Koberger led the whole class on a, on a biology paper. So he's, he's a very good student. I'm willing to bet that he studied anatomy. And by studying anatomy, by studying anatomy you would learn how to silence an individual fairly quickly. And there's really two ways to do it with a bladed instrument. One is, of course, to sever, sever the vocal cords. You know, that's a strike to right where the vocal cords are. Now, that is a very technical strike. You can, you can miss the vocal cords very easily. And the information that they put out there from the autopsy, the only person that really had a strike such as this was the young man downstairs, okay? Um, the young lady downstairs, according to what they put out there in the narrative, her strikes were of a different type of bladed weapon than the young ladies upstairs. And we'll, we'll discuss that more here in just a minute. But the other way to silence an individual with a bladed weapon is a precision strike up through the rib cage into the lung, whether it's through the front or through the rear. With that type of strike, the air is restricted. And without air, you cannot activate your vocal cords. You cannot make any sound. So the perpetrators that committed these atrocities, I believe were very knowledgeable when it comes to how to silence their victims with a bladed weapon. Now, Nothing in this world is going to make me believe that Mr. Koberger is a ninja. And for one individual to go into a home on two different floors, assassinate four different people without them making a sound, this guy would have to be a ninja. I mean, he'd have to be a, the king of the ninjas. So nothing's going to really get me to believe that. And I don't believe law enforcement believes that either. However, the narrative that law enforcement puts out there has to agree with the evidence that they're going to present in trial against Mr. Koberger. They may know many things, but there's a big difference between knowing something and having admissible evidence to prove someone's guilt. They can know all kinds of stuff, but they can't present it in trial at court. So the narrative that law enforcement puts out is obviously going to be tailored to the evidence that they're going to present against Mr. Koberger in court. Here's what I believe happened. On that night, Mr. Koberger, they said, left his apartment sometime after two, drove to Moscow, Idaho. They say these crimes were committed somewhere between 4 and 420, somewhere in that area. And they believe he finally parked his car near the residence about 4 a.m. They also believe that before he parked his car, he made several passes around that residence. Three, I believe, to be exact. I don't remember the exact times they say he made those three passes. But I do believe it was over a period of time. Because if he left his apartment at 2 in Moscow, it's only... 10 minutes away, I mean, two in Washington, it's only 10 minutes away to Moscow. 
that leaves a lot of time between two and four o'clock. Now, the law enforcement narrative is the passes that he was making around this residence were some type of reconnaissance passes, okay? Like he's driving by to see what's going on in the house from the road and trying to ascertain if it's safe for him to enter. We've already discussed how ridiculously stupid that is. Here's what I believe happened. The passes around the residence would make more sense if the first pass was to get a visual gauge on the residence. The second pass was him dropping off an assistant, if you will, to go and do real reconnaissance through the windows, get an idea of what's going on while Mr. Koberger continues to drive around. That assailant could ascertain if the young lady's bedroom doors were open or were they shut, were they locked? Was the back door open? If not, was the front door open? Were the residents up and having a good time or were they bedded down? That would be the kind of knowledge that somebody would need to execute what happened in this case. Now, Mr. Koberger's phone was either turned off, left at the apartment, put in airplane mode, nobody really knows. Does that mean Mr. Koberger had no way to communicate? As I'm going to explain a little bit later in this video, Mr. Koberger more than likely had another phone. Wasn't registered to him. He used that phone for business. Now, a phone that's not registered to him would not be known by law enforcement, even by the FBI. Even an unmasking by the CIA is not going to tell them that Mr. Koberger is using that phone. In the old days, they called them burner phones, but they are still around today, I assure you. And I'm willing to bet Mr. Koberger had his burner phone, his partner in crime had his boner, boner phone, had his burner phone, and that's how they were able to communicate. That third pass was Mr. Koberger picking up his partner. Then when they go and park their vehicle, on the last pass, that's when both of them enter the residence. One goes upstairs, one goes downstairs. The one that goes upstairs is assigned to go first. He goes in, commits the atrocity in just the way that I explained silently. Once the assailant downstairs is confirmed that he has done his business, he goes in and he commits the same atrocity. I believe he hits the young gentleman with the blow to the neck that disables his vocal cords. And in a very swift manner, again, they have blades in both hands. In a very swift manner, he assaults the young lady with the knife blow through the ribs into the lungs. He finishes off the young man. And then as he's going to finish off the young lady who is struggling in pain, trying to breathe, he says, don't worry, I'm going to help you. Meaning I'm going to help you get out of the rest of the pain that you're in. I'm going to go ahead and put you out of your misery. The assailant upstairs heads through the back door as the other assailant is heading to the back door. The other young lady opens the door and gets a look at him. Now, was that Mr. Koberger or was that his partner? Well, the only evidence they can possibly give is he had bushy eyebrows, which I think about maybe 40% of the population could be described as having bushy eyebrows. So it could have been either one. Either way, they exit the residence and they're gone. 
The crime has happened. It's over. Did one of them leave their K-bar knife sheath? No. No. When I say law enforcement will manufacture evidence, law enforcement will absolutely manufacture evidence. Now, I'm not trying to slander law enforcement. I don't believe law enforcement will manufacture evidence on a young college student that's working real hard to get his psychology degree and has never committed a crime in his life. I, do, I absolutely do not believe that they will go and, and set up some poor, innocent guy like Mr. Koberger to take the fall in a four count capital murder case. It just isn't gonna happen. They're, they're not evil people. Law enforcement is not evil people. However, if they get intelligence and they back up that intelligence with circumstantial evidence and they gather enough information for them to know for certain who the perpetrator is or who one of the perpetrators are, then if they cannot find the corroborating evidence to be able to obtain a conviction, they will absolutely manufacture evidence. And that's why that knife sheath was placed there. That's why it took so long to get DNA results back from it because they, those DNA results were planted later. And you know how the story goes from there. Now, one of the main reasons I believe that Mr. Koberger didn't do this alone was not because he, uh, it'd be hard to be capable of that by yourself, even if, even if you were you know, very, very, very efficient. You, again, you'd have to be a ninja. But Mr. Koberger also made some mistakes. He did drive his own vehicle. He was seen by cameras. There may be other evidence that comes out later against him that proves his guilt, circumstantially. But here's why Mr. Koberger made some errors, made the errors that he did. Because Mr. Koberger is a heavy methamphetamine user. Now, how do we know that? Well, when you lose 100 pounds, typically substances are involved unless you are just very, very good at dieting and exercise, which you may well have been back then. But when you're going to school to get your PhD, takes up a lot of time. You have to study, takes up a lot of time. And then also he was working as a teaching assistant, trying to earn a little extra money. That's, that's a, a big responsibility. That's, that's almost like a, a full-time job being a teacher's assistant because you're basically doing 90% of the work of the professor, including grading all the papers, including holding discussions with the class. You have to be very prepared to hold a class discussion or a or a seminar or, or whatever you want to call it with a, with a room full of college students. You can't go into those without a lot of preparation and that takes time and effort. Mr. Koberger's days were full from start to finish. However, Mr. Koberger's alibi defense in this case, which has been made public to everyone, is at nighttime, he frequently just liked to drive around. Just liked to get in my car at nighttime and I'd drive around, you know, all hours of the night until in the morning. Did it very often. Okay. Well, how do you go to school all day, study, fulfill the duties of a teacher's assistant, and then get home and instead of going to sleep, you stay up all night driving around town until in the morning when you go back to school and you start all over again. Insomnia is absolutely an inadequate excuse for that. And what really solidified this for me is watching an interview that a news reporter did with one of his neighbors. 
And I absolutely believe everything she said. She was, a, she was an Asian lady. And as they were asking her about Mr. Koberger, the one thing that she mentioned that was very important to her was the fact that he made a lot of noise up there at nighttime. All hours of the night, he would wash his clothes, he would vacuum all night long. Now, how is Mr. Koberger staying up all night long, vacuuming, doing clothes, doing everything else, driving all over the world, and never going to sleep, and then going to school all day and fulfilling the duties of a teacher's assistant? Well, there's only one way he can do that, folks, and, and let me tell you, that's with methamphetamine. Nothing else is going to give him the ability to do that day after day. That also is the connection between Mr. Koberger and the organization that I've been speaking of. What is he doing all hours of the night? He's probably not out trying to obtain his drugs because Mr. Koberger, I would imagine, had very tight finances. A drug habit like that is, it's, it's not gonna it's not gonna to last too long without some money or without the ability to obtain what he wants through other means. I believe Mr. Koberger was a collector for this organization. They would send him out to collect debts owed to them. That's why he was an easy pick when it came to sending the message to these young ladies. Excuse me, not sending the message to the young ladies, but sending the message through these young ladies to the people that the message was really supposed to be sent to, which was their mothers. And when I say I mean, their mother and their stepmother, okay, just to be on the, just to clarify. But that also would send a message to anybody else out there that was considering making a deal with that drug task force that turns out it's actually a four county drug task force, which is a really big one. That means they really have some serious drug problems up there. And again, that's why this investigation, the narrative is so important for them. And, and, and as bad as this sounds, a narrative of a Ted Bundy, random Ted Bundy, randomly committing an atrocity on college students is a much better narrative for that drug task force because they're working on a much larger investigation with many, many more individuals that can be implicated in those crimes, and that's what's important to them, but also to that college and that town because the entire town their economy is based on that university. Now, if you have a university that hits the headlines that there is a rampant drug problem with crime organizations that are eliminating young college students, now that is a university that parents will not send their children to. Oh no, I'm not sending you there. They're drugs everywhere they're killing the kids that is not a safe place we'll send you to another university a creepy psycho ted bundy commits an atrocity well that's a one-off that could happen anywhere in the united states so the narrative is very very important to not only law enforcement but also the college the community that the college is in everybody's economy is 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 tied to this university so with that being said, I think I've, I've discussed too much in this video. I've got a few more that I'm going to continue to explain my perspective on this. And again, my final video will bring it all together. I'll take all aspects of my theory from start to finish, every aspect of it, and wrap it up into a bow with one huge piece of evidence that nobody has has put together yet and i'm not gonna put that one out there until the last video so with that being said once again thank you for watching 
I'm your host, Pavarotti, and we'll see you next time.